So, the A6009 are constantly regarded as some of the best budget cameras on the market, and so a while back I actually bought the top of the line Sony A6500. In fact, I have it right here. However, the A6500 was released all the way back in 2016, so should you still buy it in 2019, or should you look for something more modern? Here are my thoughts. How's it going guys, Will here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Sony A6500 and deciding whether it's worth it in 2019. I've been using it for the past five months and in that time I found what I like, what I don't like, and some potential problems with this camera that we're just going to go over in this video. Before we get into this video though, I do want to quickly say that this review will be tackled almost entirely from a video perspective. I do occasionally do stills on this camera, but again, I have mostly been using this camera for video. First of all, design. The A6500 is a mirrorless camera with a pretty compact footprint, styled closer to a compact camera than a DSLR, and is overall pretty small. Whether you like it or not is down to your personal preference, however, I kind of like the smaller look to it. Then again, I also like big cameras, I'm shooting on one right now. I think I might just like cameras. The material feels really good and premium, but the screen the screen. We're going to talk more about the screen later on. However, all we need to know for now is it's held on by these tilt arms. They don't feel particularly strong. I've never dropped mine, so I can't say how strong they are. But I'd say exercise caution when dealing with the screen. Next, usability. The button layout does seem pretty well planned out on the A6500. I really like the aperture slash shutter speed dial placement, and the custom mode dials are incredible. This is one of the biggest time savers on the camera and seems like a solution for perhaps the worst menu system that I've ever seen. Not only is it stupidly time consuming to navigate, but you can't actually use the touch screen on the menu, which would have made the menu so much easier to navigate. Realistically though, most of the time you're gonna be using either the custom modes or you're just gonna set and forget. So it's not really that big of an issue, but for beginners, this menu is atrocious. Next, and probably the most important part of any camera, is the image quality. On the Sony A6500, the 4K image quality is nothing short of outstanding. It's actually downscaled from a 6K image to a 4K image, so that 4K image that you get in the end is so much sharper than almost any other camera that I've seen at this price point. Of course, this means that the Sony A6500 is great for tech videos, or like product videos, or food, anything that requires a lot of detail. I really can't overstate how sharp the 4K is on this camera, and this was actually one of the main reasons why I picked it up in the first place. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for the 1080p. This is actually one of the worst 1080p images I've seen on a camera of this price point, and for me, this is a huge issue because I love to shoot 1080p but the bitrate just isn't high enough to handle it. Overall the 1080p 24fps image out of this camera is just simply dwarfed in comparison to the 4k it's not even in the same league. The 120p however that's a different story. Because it's got the higher bitrate, the 120p out of this camera does actually look pretty good if you shoot it right. I actually made a video on how to get your 120p looking good up there. You should check that out next to uh, what's up there. That, that beam there. See that beam? Yeah, click on the beam. But yeah, because of the higher bitrate, the 120p on this camera actually does look pretty good. 60p again is unusable. In fact, I think this is the worst 60p I've seen on any camera, including cheaper cameras such as the Panasonic G7. It even looks worse than the 720p 60fps out of my five-year-old 70D, which really isn't a good look for Sony. So that said, if 60fps is a big deal for you, then I strongly recommend looking elsewhere. Out the camera colors on the A6500 are actually really good despite the reputation that Sony has and honestly there's not much to complain about here. However, the same can't be said for the general color science. Now, color science does not mean out the camera colors. That's one of the biggest misconceptions in the camera world right now. Everybody thinks that color science means out the camera color, so a common response is, oh, you can just color grade it and fix it. No. That's not what color science is. Out the camera colors are a very small bit of color science. There's also gamuts, highlight roll off, pixel quality, there's a ton of stuff involved in color science, and the overall color science on this camera isn't great. I just said color science like 20 times. Whoa! Wind is, wind is kicking up. Jeez. Speaking of gamuts, Sony's are very big, meaning that the highlight roll-off is not great on the A6500. This can be remedied slightly with some properly exposed S-Log2, which we will be talking about in more detail later on. But again, if in standard mode you ever need to pull back detail, 
pretty much forget it. So why is this a big deal? Surely we can just shoot in SL2 all the time, right? Well, no. A lot of people buying this camera may be inexperienced or even beginners, so shooting SL may be out the question as it does take a lot of practice. That said, if you do know how to shoot S log and you nail your exposure, then congratulations on getting some incredible dynamic range and also leveling up your footage like 100 points. Following this is the lens selection. Now this is growing on Sony's side, but in my opinion, the lower end stuff is just a tad expensive. So what I personally do is I take this EF to E mount adapter and with the A6500, it works an absolute charm. The autofocus is simply incredible and it actually works pretty well with the touchscreen so you can get some of that tap to focus action, some rack focuses maybe. Overall, the speed and the accuracy of the autofocus are both great on this camera. Big thumbs up from me. IBIS also works great and while it's not gimbal levels of stabilization, it does smooth out a ton of micro jitters that generally come along with having a smaller camera. However, there is one huge problem with the IBIS that actually broke my A6500 for two whole months. Somehow the IBIS managed to dislodge the sensor, effectively bricking the camera, and according to the handy dandy internet, this is unfortunately common on a lot of Sony cameras with IBIS. Luckily though, for this particular model, it isn't all that common. However, I did want to quickly put that in just to make you guys aware of that. One final note on the screen is that it will dim itself in 4K and 120p, which are my most commonly used modes, so that kind of sucks. But it is what it is, so if you shooting a lot of harsh light, I suggest getting used to the frankly excellent viewfinder or getting an external monitor. If light isn't harsh, then honestly it's fine and all in all you can get some really amazing looking footage out the A6500 for way less than the footage looks like it's worth. So should you buy the A6500 in 2019? Well, if you want to use it as a 4K camera, then it's honestly a treat to use. As I said, it works great with tech and product cinematography, anything that requires a high level of detail. And again, this is the best 4K image I've ever seen on a camera of this price point. So if you want a really good budget 4K camera, then you can't really go wrong with the A6500. Okay guys, so thank you for watching. Remember to like the video if you want to see more content like this and smash the subscribe button. I'm trying to hit 10K by May the 1st, so every single subscription is massively appreciated. I'm done for now, and I will see you guys in the next video.